Welcome to the West Virginia Law Review's uh, Home Rule Symposium. And this is our first panel on uh, home rule and gun regulation. Uh, assessing gun sanctuaries that conflict with state law by concentrating on gun violence in Seattle and Pittsburgh. So my name is Will Ree, and I'm a professor here at WVU Law. I also teach a seminar on firearms law and policy. And I have the privilege today to be joined by our two wonderful panelists, um, you know, going from your right to your left. Uh, Sheila Simon is an assistant professor at the Southern Illinois University School of Law. Professor Simon rejoined the SIU law faculty after serving as Lieutenant Governor of Illinois from 2011 to 2015. As Lieutenant Governor, she worked on many issues including education policy and secured funding for rape crisis centers. Professor Simon was the SIU Law Domestic Violence Clinic's first staff attorney, an assistant state's attorney, a staff attorney at Land of Lincoln Legal Assistance, and a private practitioner. Um, she also served on the Carbondale City Council from 2003 to 2007. Matthew Davis is a visiting lecturer in law at the Birmingham City University School of Law in the United Kingdom, where he teaches constitutional administrative and criminal law. He is also a PhD candidate with the Birmingham City University American Legal Studies Center. His doctoral, doctoral research focuses on the role that pressure groups like the National Rifle Association and the American Legislative Exchange Council play in the US to preempt local governments from regulating firearms. Okay, so um, Professor Simon, I want to get us started please. Okay, I'm compliant now. Um, so if you find Carbonell, it's in the bottom of the state. So kind of, if you find the confluence of the Mississippi and the Ohio, you're in the right department. It's not a big place, uh, but that's Carbondale. And then if you want to, see if you can find your way up to Chicago, because if you live in Carbondale and you want to do anything in the state of Illinois, you're going to spend a lot of time going up to Chicago, because that's the even though the state capital is Springfield, the political headquarters of the state is Chicago. Um, so I know from my four years as lieutenant governor, I know all the best bathrooms and gas stations in the state of Illinois. And one of the best is in Effingham, Illinois, at the intersection of uh, Highway 57 and 70. Um, so if you can find Effingham, you can see that there. It's an outstanding gas station. I have to recommend this. Um, <laughs> exactly. If you need to know where you can change clothes in the bathroom, you can do it at Jack Flash in Effingham. Um, so anyway, when I heard on the radio that Effingham County was declaring itself a gun sanctuary, <laughs> I was really distraught. I'm like, okay, so that sounds like a crazy idea, and does it mean I will not be able to stop at my favorite gas station when I'm driving up to Chicago? And, and didn't think too much about it after that. Uh, and then got this call for papers, and I'm like, this is it. This is the conflict between state and local government. That's, this is what's going on here. So it's a great excuse 
to learn more about what's going on. So let me give you, what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the historical background of how we got to that Second Amendment sanctuary, uh, what the whole sanctuary movement has meant over time in different ways, um, and federal, state, local regulations of guns, and then just a kind of a wrap up on what does it all mean about democracy. So, um, so the history, Parkland school shooting, lots of calls for gun control, five measures proposed in the state assembly uh, almost right away, and local governments around the state do what local governments do, and I've been on the city council voting for, here's our resolution to encourage our representatives to vote for or against something. So Iroquois County, closer up to Chicago, says we're doing a resolution against these five new gun control measures. Effingham County looks at it and says, yep, we want to do that too, only we want to put a little bit more punch into it. Um, let's take advantage of this sanctuary city language that's being used in the immigration context, and let's call ourselves a sanctuary county for Second Amendment rights. So Effingham County did that, and, and the resolution says, we oppose those five new bills, and by the way, if you pass any of them, we're going to be a Second Amendment sanctuary, and we're not going to enforce any of that. Um, so, so that's where it started uh, at this it's not, didn't start at the gas station, but you know the place now. Um, started there and then really took off. Um, if you were going to avoid stopping at a gas station uh, in any county that had a Second Amendment sanctuary in Illinois now, you'd probably have to drive from Carbondale up to just outside Chicago. We have 102 counties and over 60 of them have a sanctuary minute. And, and it's not just Illinois. It's all over. Um, Professor Diller talked about uh, blue cities in red states. Where this gun sanctuary amendment comes up is red counties in blue states, which is exactly what's going on in Effingham and those other places in Illinois. We've got a predominantly rural county in a state that because of the overwhelming population of Chicago is a, is a liberal and democratic state. Um, so, so that's the history. It just kind of caught on. People said, oh, that's a, that's a good idea, and it hasn't stopped. And the discussion of Virginia, Virginia and Kentucky both, uh, moves towards more Democrats in either the, the governor's mansion in Kentucky, the legislature in Virginia, and all of a sudden local governments that are more conservative are looking at this and saying, do we want to be a sanctuary uh, county or sanctuary city? So, so the first thing I did is I want to know more about what sanctuary is. And I looked up in the really cool history of sanctuary, which I identified as a, as a Christianity kind of concept, dates way back before that. Uh, it's associated with religious locations and fleeing to the religious temple, place of religious observation to avoid persecution. Uh, and it was totally cool. Uh, all the all the State people said, yep, we can do that. It's kind of a, a, a relief valve. Um, and the church people said, yeah, okay, we can do that. Even got the okay from a whole series of popes who said, yep, this makes sense. Uh, come to our church. Live out your life in the church. You can be safe. Uh, give up your worldly belongings. Cha-ching. Score one for the church. Um, and, uh, and you can avoid the prosecution, up to and including the death penalty by staying in the church, and for some reason the states accepted this, you know. Uh, gradually over time that acceptance fell away. Pope turns it down, states are like, no, you, you've got to serve your sentence. You get convicted, um, but still there's not a sense that we're going to go into the church and get people. So the next phase in development in, in terms of our perspective on immigration uh, and sanctuary was in the 1980s when people were being uh, told they had to leave and often be separated from their families. And at this point, churches again offered a place for these folks to stay. Uh, so it's again uh, a physical location. And this time, the price wasn't so much give up your worldly belongings as it was. Um, could you help us educate the rest of the community about your situation? Can we be a part of changing what we see as an unjust law? Sure, let's do that. Uh, so it became a more political thing. And then the most recent set of immigration sanctuary city ordinances, declarations, uh, 
takes it into one further twist, which is not so much that we're actually providing shelter or providing a place for people to stay, but we're, we're, we're making a policy statement. We're saying, we're not gonna cooperate with that. And sometimes cities have room to say that. They have some law enforcement that can choose to uh, cooperate with the federal folks or not. Um, but some of the immigration sanctuary declarations are really kind of out there. So my daughter, uh, uh, my younger daughter, w lived and worked in Chicago for a while, and she worked at a restaurant, and she told me one day, she said, Mommy, do you know that our restaurant is the first sanctuary restaurant in Chicago? <laughs> and I'm like, well, good for you, honey, but that's not a thing. Um, and, and obviously, the restaurant is not sheltering people for years on end in the restaurant. They just keep you for a while and serve really good fried chicken. Uh, but they want to make a declaration. They want to make a point. They want to say, we recognize that these laws are unjust, and, and we're making a statement about it. So this is the context when Effingham County looks at the laws and says, yeah, we can use that kind of idea. We can make a statement. We can make a statement about our value for guns. Uh, so they did, so it took hold. So that's kind of the, the sanctuary thing. Um, so that gets us to who regulates all this, which is really interesting, and I'm very much interested in, in what Matt has to say about, uh, about pressures on localities, states, and, and, and who's exerting the pressure. So we have kind of a tension between federal and state government, right? There are some areas where federal can regulate, some areas where states can regulate, um, but not so much of a tension between state and local because the states are big dudes in the fight, right? The states can say, if we wanna take over and regulate this part, if we wanna have our laws in this part, then you, the local government, are just gonna have to back off. And that's exactly where these Second Amendment sanctuaries fall in, right? People are saying in these local jurisdictions, uh, if you pass another law, if you limit our rights, we are not gonna have anything to do with it. We're gonna back off, we're not gonna enforce that, and that's of course when the state law is gonna preempt the local. So, so legally, the impact is just not much. Um, there are different ways to challenge something that a, that a local set of folks might see as unconstitutional, but saying we're not gonna participate in your state law is not one of the options as far as I see it. Um, so that got me far enough to know, okay, I can still go to the gas station in Effingham. Um, but, but I wanted to, to think about it a little bit more and, and figure out whether there is some value in this. And, and I think there is. And I think it's the value of allowing a distinct policy minority in an area to be able to say something, to be, to be able to have kind of a beefy comment. It's not just the letter to the state house and senate member from the area, uh, but a public statement uh, about how we feel about rights that we think we have. Um, and I think it exposes maybe a, a, a flaw in our, in our democratic system that we don't, when we're in the majority, listen often enough and closely enough to folks who have a minority point of view. Um, so this theory of having local folks express more in terms of, uh, of what they want to do, how they want the state law to be, uh, has been coined as uh, federalism all the way down by a professor, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me. And she says uh, any governmentally associated body ought to be able to have the ability to speak out about issues where even they don't have any control. Can the library board make a statement about immigration? Can the library board make a statement about gun rights or poverty or you name it? Uh, the idea of federalism all the way down says, yes, they ought to be able to do that. And we know it will have no legal impact because everyone knows they have no control, but it will make us a better informed governing body. Um, because as a, when you look at that map, so, um, so I'm a Democrat, part of the majority in the state of Illinois, um, but I'm from the area where people have a minority point of view on, on using guns and possessing guns. Um, 
and, and there's a whole lot of tension. And this year in some counties when we're gonna be voting in the primary, some counties are gonna vote for an idea that comes up on a fairly regular basis, uh, should we divide up the state of Illinois and make it uh, uh, Chicago and the rest of us, <laughs> right? Um, but think about that. So Illinois is not unique. There are all sorts of states that have, um, that have a majority point of view and have a large urban center that controls a lot of the political power and that can, when they want to, ignore the rest of the gang. Um, and not that I think the majority ought to change its mind, but I think the majority ought to do a better job on listening to those who have that other point of view. Uh, and this Second Amendment sanctuary, I think, is a decent handle uh, on having that point of view, having that voice in the process and having your voice have just a little bit more elevated value. So that's, that's my thing, and I will be able to uh, toss it over to Matt, or should we have questions now? What's, what's the plan? Maybe um, we'll take one or two questions uh, before we go on to Matt. Anyone, anyone have questions on Professor Simon's presentation in particular? Okay, I was gonna say, otherwise, if you could hold your questions until the end, um, you know, we'll have a question and answer uh, period then, so. How does that little bit of value that you talk about manifest itself, other than just making the statement? In terms of, of the, the small group saying, hey, we don't like what the big group is doing, I think the value is to know that you've been heard, right? What do, what do the malpractice insurers tell us about uh, how the best, what's the best way to avoid malpractice? is to always return your client's phone calls and to know that they have had their day in court. Because people don't always, you know, they know that they're not always gonna be able to win, but if they feel they've been heard, if they feel they've had their day in court, even when they lose, it's a little bit more acceptable that way. So I think there's, there's something to knowing that you were indeed heard, even if you don't wind up winning. They sure did. Like all the other counties, the 60 plus counties that have enacted this ordinance, um, uh, and their their representatives are overwhelmingly Republican. So they have they have a voice in Springfield, and their voice too is in the minority there. Yeah. Uh, to what extent is this merely expressive, and how much is it actual civil disobedience if they're not? If the elected fish, the sheriffs are not going to enforce the law and the elected prosecutor is not going to bring charges, that seems a little more than just expressing uh, opposition. Yeah, so it, that's a very good question because I think there is some misunderstanding on the part of some folks who are like, great, we're in a county that's not gonna do that kind of liberal gun law. Um, and, and I think everyone involved in the enforcement understands that's that, that that's not accurate. In fact, the state's attorney in Effingham County who first proposed this language that was enacted uh, told everyone there, you know, it's, it's gonna be, this is not gonna have the legal impact that it looks like. Um, so I think most folks who are informed uh, know that it's not going to do that. There is probably some danger that if there's a general feeling that we can do more, uh, that, that maybe things will get a little bit carried away. There's also a really interesting point, and we'll, I, maybe I'll, I'll see if I've got a question for Matt when he's done. All right. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Great. Thank you. So first, can you hear? So first, I appreciate the invite. It's first time I actually get to present this to an American audience. So as you, as you heard from my introduction, I teach in England, but as you can tell from my accent, yeah, unfortunately I don't have the English accent. Um, <laughs> so, but it is also great to be on YouTube too. I have a seven year old and like the fact that I got to go to a conference doesn't matter. The fact that dad's gonna be on YouTube will score me points for about 30 seconds, so I'll try to enjoy them. Um, 
So yeah, today I'm looking at um, case studies of Seattle and Pittsburgh and contemporary local firearms regulations in the face of the attack on American cities. And I frame this both to look at the paper for this conference as well as my overall PhD, which looks at pressure groups and how they impact the ability of local uh, governments to regulate firearms or to the extent they can regulate firearms. When I use the phrasing attack on American cities, obviously I'm stealing from Richard Schrager's research. The, the paper is attack on American cities. Um, somewhat um, a little bit pointed for some people, but I, I think, and, or provocative, but I think it kind of makes the point. And the recent times interstate preemption has been characterized as an attack on American cities. By that, I don't mean that they're going out and trying to completely erode what the cities do, but when certain when cities pick up policy issues, they generally are trying to regulate an issue they don't see the state responding to or they don't see the federal government responding to. And in a lot of cases, especially with more recent firearms uh, preemption, it's not preemption in that dictionary sense, whereas there is a missing element that doing something first doesn't happen. It's usually a reaction to it. Within the research, the research aim is actually to look at the strategic, strategic uh, litigation efforts of pressure groups. Um, my overarching PhD looks at ALEC and the NRA, but this one is a little bit more broad. Um, but firearms is significantly different, whereas I believe fracking has 16 states that have preemption statutes. Whoever has been involved with preemption of firearms has been extremely successful, and unfortunately we've had a little technical error, so I've, it's cut off actually the area where Seattle is, so um, I don't miss the irony in that. Um, but I can, can guarantee that the, the map is accurate. I know uh, Gifford Center and Everyday Town for Gun Violence has similar things. We just went through and pulled every single preemption statute from the legislative website for each state that has them. Um, so when we're looking at this, we were looking at cities are still trying to regulate firearms. States are still acting. How do we try to understand why? How do we try to understand what these new issues are being tackled? We thought, well, let's look at litigation. What are they fighting over? What is the area of conflict? And with that, I chose Seattle and Pittsburgh because, of course, Pittsburgh dealt with the recent uh, synagogue shooting. And they clearly said that in their, their ordinance, that they were trying to respond to this. But what drew me to Seattle and Pittsburgh as well is that they weren't just looking at mass shootings, which you know catch media attention, you see it on the news, but we see a lot of issues when it comes to gun violence that has to do with mental health issues, someone being, having access to firearms that perhaps given their, their mental state shouldn't have it or you could argue they shouldn't. Both cities actually saw this as a public health and a public safety issue. While not directly arguing policing powers, you can see that that old style policing power that you think about of you know, protecting your city or as the cities of uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh argued in uh, Commonwealth versus or, or Ortiz versus Commonwealth is that this is the reason for our existence, to protect our people from harm. And also when you look at some of the research that these cities attach, they didn't just put out an ordinance. If you go on their respective legislators, they actually put out research they were looking at. They were reflecting on um, the CDC data on gun violence, that over 38,000 Americans on average a year die of related gun violence. And as we see from the CDC methodology, that might be underreported as well. What they also did is looked at potential factors or potential increased risks as um, the federal, federal assault weapons ban was allowed to sunset. How is that impacted? And they tried to respond to this. And obviously the ordinances are far more complex, but for timing, I picked out three. And I looked at the safe storage of firearms, which both cities tried to tackle, uh, the extreme risk protection orders, which Pittsburgh tried to tackle. Seattle, Seattle doesn't have to because Washington already has it on the state statute books. Reporting lost or stolen firearms and magazine capacity. And I intentionally phrase this as magazine capacity because part of the argument is how we look at this when, when it comes to both the plaintiffs against the city of Pittsburgh and the city of Pittsburgh itself. The city of Pittsburgh refers to it as 
high capacity magazines, whereas the plaintiffs in Anderson refer to it as standard capacity magazines. So, is it, yeah, oh, is it not, okay. Oh, it does have the graphics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least this part worked, so. So before we go into it, we want to look at the state local dynamic within each state. So with Pennsylvania, In Pennsylvania, Dillon's rule has been applied, and it was applied relatively early, even before Hunter versus Pittsburgh. So this is not a new phenomenon. With Washington, it was a little bit later, but we also see some remnants of it that uh, Professor Hugh Spitzer from the University of Seattle, I believe it is, has actually argued that this is not what the legislative intent is. It's kind of this judges not giving out this old view on the importance of Dillon's rule, and of course the fact that some special districts in Washington still, Dillon's rule still applies. So what he has effectively argued that there is some spillover effect with Dillon's rule e when it comes to judicial review when it necessarily shouldn't be. Um, with home rule, there, it was relatively recent in or relatively new early in Washington, 1889, and it's in the state constitution, whereas Pennsylvania the state legislature literally had days left to enact the statute before they finally did. So there is significant contrast in early development of the Constitution of Pennsylvania it really did not have an idea of any concept of city autonomy, or to, at least not to the extent that Washington did. Is that working? Now, both states have preemption. And effectively, when we're looking at these policy issues that I, I've raised with the city ordinances, is um, I'm looking at sub-policy issues or trying to find a way to question the whether the state has fully occupied the field or to what extent they have. And then if that extent is not complete or absolute, what areas can they actually regulate on? With Washington, says it fully occupies the field and when it comes to registration, licensing, possession, purchase, sale, acquisition, transfer, discharge, and transportation of firearms. But not working. Okay. with Pennsylvania, similar in any it prohibits any municipality in any manner to regulate the lawful ownership, possession, or transfer of firearms. But the other thing that the state of Pennsylvania did was to add the second clause down there. That's actually part of the home rule law. When it came into force, they said, you have home rule, but just in case you think you might be able to regulate firearms, think again. And this has been part of the issue when it comes to cities trying to argue when it, when it some level of authority when it comes to regulating firearms. And if you look at some of the judicial history in the state of Pennsylvania, it's actually Pittsburgh and Philadelphia repeatedly that are the respondents to some of these cases. So they've tried this over and over and over. And it's the same thing with Washington too. If you go through some, a lot of the jurisprudence when it comes to city authority for regulating firearms, it's you know, a, a plaintiff against Seattle, most, more times than not. So with the Seattle suit, and both of these are actually pending on appeal, with the Seattle suit, the first one was Alim. Alim versus Seattle, which was backed by the NRA. They were originally party to the lawsuit. And what they did was they were challenging, first, the safe storage ordinance that requires you to lock up, lock up your, your firearms or at least put a trigger lock on it, depending on the, the type of firearm. If it's a handgun, you put a trigger lock. Or in other ways, just make it inaccessible to people who are unauthorized users. It's not meant to make it impossible for the lawful owner to use that firearms. The idea is to protect you know, your child, for example, from being able to pick up your firearm. And also what they wanted to do is for you to report lost or stolen firearms. Not, nothing more than that, nothing to truly infringe. And 
Seattle, though, I would say had a little bit cleverer of an argument than when it came to Pittsburgh. Seattle actually challenged the NRA standing. They effectively said that the NRA did not suffer any harm because they don't have a policy that says that they're against the safe storage of firearms. It, and of course, challenged rightness, and in fairness, the NRA probably jumped the gun. The, the ordinance wasn't actually in force, and they filed. Um, and so this was kicked out at first instance, but it is on appeal. And we've also been watching Bass versus Edmonds just because Bass is actually a um, city ordinance or city ordinance um, city as opposed to Seattle, which is a first class home rule city. So we're trying to see whether having a home rule charter matters. And to some extent we've seen in other fields, other areas of uh, local authority, it does matter. But does it matter specifically to firearms? With Pittsburgh, we actually have picked out the three main cases that are, two of them are being appealed. The original, original case actually was looking at whether this ordinance, these ordinance related to um, safe storage of firearms and extreme risk protection orders actually violated an old um, agreement between uh, the city of Seattle, or sorry, the city of Pittsburgh and a old applicant. So it was effectively attempt to court for not following a court order. Um, but they challenged all, both uh, city ordinances. With Anderson, Anderson specifically challenged magazine capacity. And this was an interesting case because Anderson argued that it's not high capacity magazines when you get above 10 rounds. And they actually went through the scenario of saying that, well, if you only allow 10 rounds, and this is actually in the court documents, that you may not be able to re repel multiple assailants. Like the idea that you would need more than 10 rounds and this is just a standard course of life that if you can't have high capacity magazines, you, you might not be able to protect yourself if someone attacks you. This is an actual argument. Ul ultimately, the case hinged on whether the state had fully preempted the field and the judge in all three cases, same person, ruled that it had. Um, and then firearms owners against crime, if the name stands out, it's because they're a regular litigant. Um, if you see Harrisburg, city of Harrisburg is actually facing a case against them right now that is already at the Commonwealth Court. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of uh, online court systems, the Pennsylvania state court's been down, so we don't know where they are with, with the Commonwealth as of last week. So, like I said, the, the interpretation of the state preemption clause is having reserved the entire field related by Judge J James, who was the judge in all three cases against Pittsburgh, is based on really strong precedent. I, I raised earlier uh, Ortiz versus Commonwealth, and effectively, they, both the city of Pittsburgh and the city of Philadelphia raised this argument that th this is what we exist for, the idea that we represent our people that we have to keep them free from harm or at least to the extent possible. And the court directly said that this argument was frivolous. Not reject, not that you don't have the scope, frivolous. The, so, I, I, and honestly, as a result of that, I think that the precedent suggests that Pittsburgh's not gonna be successful. And I think, but with Washington, we have something a little bit different we have this idea of a distinction between the legal result. So in Cherry, they actually looked at the legislative history in Washington. They found that the actual intent for the preemption law wasn't to completely preempt the field on every count. It was to actually create uniformity in criminal law in Washington. And if you look at how the ordinance in Seattle was drafted, it looks like they're trying to do that and they're learning because they, they have missed out. They've tried it before and they were challenged in Chan when they, tried to, when they tried to regulate the use of firearms in public parks. And ultimately, the actual penalty for that was seen to be a criminal penalty. But in this case, in these two ordinances related to safe storage and related to uh, reporting lost and stolen firearms, it's clear, at least in my opinion, it's clear that it's just a civil law uh, result. And so I think on that case, I think I think that Seattle will be probably successful, but what I'm quite interested too is 
seeing how both Alim and Bass play out because it'll give us an understanding of whether home rule is even relevant when it comes to the regulation of firearms because you have a code city in Bass and a first class home rule city in Seattle. There, it looks like on the merits because they're both dealing with safe storage ordinance that they might be combined when they go to the state uh, Supreme Court. And it'd be interesting to see whether a home rule city in, in Washington does have the authority that a home rule city in Pennsylvania does not have when it comes to regulating firearms. So, I mean, very clearly, what we've found to date is that there is a differing level of municipal authority for cities to regulate generally when it comes to uh, Washington and, and Pennsylvania. And we do see that this, these strategic litigation efforts of, of these pressure groups, in this case, generally the NRA or NRA affiliates, is part of this broader attack on American cities. But it, and it also is following that same trend of not really preempting in the, tech, in the dictionary sense, but responding to policy innovation. And what we're seeing is, in a lot of cases, it's when states are doing nothing. The federal government is not is doing nothing as well. So they're not necessarily trying to jump into a field that the state has preempted and then turned around and passed legislation to deal with a certain issue. Effectively, what the strategic litigation efforts are doing is the same thing that these uh, preemption legislation has been doing is maintaining the status quo. And when I say maintaining the status quo, I'm referring to the firearms violence we see now. Over 38,000 Americans at least being dying every year with firearms related violence. But you also have things that, if you look at, in 2016, the, uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights for the UN actually raised these issues about how even when it comes to firearms violence, it actually impacts other people's rights. It impacts your, you know, your, obviously your, your, the potential for right to life, but your willingness to freely express yourself. For example, if someone can carry a firearm to a political rally, or as we've seen in past elections, when a candidate was speaking in Arizona, it was okay for someone to ca openly carry a firearm. Um, but the other thing that was, was raised too is that when you allow for free access to, to firearms, such as when, it, especially when it comes to extreme risk protection orders, you expose um, people who have been, who have suffered from domestic violence, especially in a repeated issue, is you, you make that situation more extreme to them. You actually expose them to potentially being harmed a lot more. And that, the thing is, is that when we, when we see, for example, in the city of Pennsylvania, or sorry, in the state of Pennsylvania, is there is no extreme risk protection orders, despite the fact that the, now we see the governor is actually, for some of the legislation has actually been supported with Pittsburgh, they're not doing that. So we're at, the idea that um, you can have access to these firearms is, is something that is just being left. It's, it's a sil it, there's silence on the legislative end. And I think, When we see, I, and, and the other interesting thing I've seen with looking at the strategic litigation is looking at some of these issues going forward, especially this criminal civil distinction, is there's actually a bill before the, the House, I believe it is, in Utah right now that is actually trying to close this loop we, where they specifically completely and entirely preempt the entire field, they, including express language where the civil criminal, civil criminal penalty and also looking at this issue of legislative immunity. So we're not the only ones seeing this. It's, it's these pressure groups are actually looking at how the cities respond to these litigation strategies. And at the same token, when we see other cities when it comes to these pressure groups, like the city of Carson in California, they were ready to pass um, local firearms regulation and then the NRA got people to sh show up. They threatened suit, did the same thing with Los Angeles and both cities back backed away. So what we're seeing with this as well is not only the enforcement of preemption, but these cities are being made an example of. So if you're a smaller city that might want to do this, the fear of litigation makes you just cringe at the idea of doing it. So something you would rather, as a city council member that you might want to get involved with, you feel restrained from doing so. And with that, thank you. <laughs>
So before we um, open it up to everybody, um, Sheila, did you have a question for Matt? There we go. In firearm advocacy groups choosing to advocate for their rights at a level of larger government, mm -hmm. at, at national or state levels, um, and having been involved in government both at local and state levels, there's a real difference in responsiveness uh, and, and how you can change things. It's just, it's an interesting strategy choice to me for a right that is founded on the idea that we ought to be able to use the firearms to change our government when we need to. Um, so so is, it, is it a big strategy picture or is it just a, we see this opportunity here so we're gonna take it? Um, I think I can answer that in part just to the extent I see it. I do think it's part of a, I mean, you see the opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, where when it comes to cities, for example, when they try to organize for something like this, it's a little bit harder. They don't have the political power, especially in states where you have cities that, or politicians cannot run on a party platform. They must be apolitical. Mm -hmm. So how does, you know, in California, for example, if we had the opposite version where we had a more Republican-controlled um, legislature and they were wanting to preempt a lot stri more stringent, like Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. smaller cities couldn't do much because most of the most of the city uh, representatives or city uh, politicians are not allowed to affiliate themselves with the party. So it, I mean, part of it is is that they they see first they've been successful. Like that when it comes to right. firearms, that's the one thing that I keep reiterating when I present my work is that when it comes to firearms, they're just more successful. So it's taking advantage of the success you already have, but also recognizing that. Cities are an inequitable issue. Like I, I think um, Professor Diller was raising a um, some research done on looking at you know the less that cities in California spend on lobbying, the less they get back in terms of funding too. So when you see this inequitable bargaining power, inequitable just power generally for cities, they're just taking taking advantage of what's yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we have plenty of time for a question and answer. So um, for anybody. Thanks. I don't know if you can, um, well, we probably all remember it. Your first slide seemed to me to be the most important one because that was the slide that showed, I think, the states where you have statutes preempting local firearm regulation. Mm -hmm. And that was about, what, 45 states or? Yeah, 40, 43 and then two that are kind of, you know, hybrid and where they do a little bit, like California, for example. So the litigation of groups like the NRA or these other groups you mentioned, I mean, they're they're only good strategies because you have those laws in the first place, which mm -hmm. I think go back to the 1980s, maybe the 1990s. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they, they're, they haven't been around forever, but they've been around you know, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm surprised or I wanna know more about like what is Seattle doing to overturn those laws in the Washington State Legislature? Is, is there talk about that? My guess is in Pennsylvania, it's a little less likely, but it would seem like in Washington, um, why is that not in, to use a bad, on here, the crosshairs of the state legislature, <laughs> you know, to get rid of those laws. Well, there actually is um, HB 1374 that's being debated right now in, in Washington that would actually go further than, I know Oregon has tried to give a little bit more authority, but this would actually pretty much remove that preemption statute in Washington. It was um, introduced last year and just went to committee and went nowhere. First reading and that's it. And so far that's the, where we are in Washington. But it does show that there there is a little bit more. But the other thing is with with Seattle is that you know the law just gives them a little bit more authority. Um, if you look at some of the other places where they've been successful, they've actually been able to tax firearms. And as long as in, under Washington state law, as long as you can show a public benefit, you can do that. So in a way, you're regulating firearms by using your taxing authority. Where you know if you look at um, gosh, I can't remember uh, the there's a long 2001. Um, survey of all you know, home rule in the, United, in the United States, if you see some of the other states that have no taxing authority and very little uh, financial authority, that's just not possible. Thank you. Um, any other questions for our panelists? And again, this is being simulcast, so if you could wait for the microphone, we appreciate that. Um, yes, 
for me, I see a strong parallel between um, the current debate about firearms as well as the debate about marijuana legalization. In a lot of those cases, the states have uh, states and cities have taken um, steps, even such as the Morgantown City Council right now has voted to decriminalize, but it's created a bunch of um, other issues there. My, my question really is, uh, have referendums, local or state referendums, been used as a tool um, to debate some of these topics around firearms? And if they have not, um, what have been some of the reasons that they haven't? That's a good question. I know in, in Illinois we have very limited ability to have referenda, uh, so it's just not not a tool that we're using. Um, it's an interesting parallel with the marijuana situation. I think that's more of a conflict between, well, I say this from a state that just legalized it, right? So we're we're just branching into this, um, but it's more of a the challenge is the difference between federal regulation and state regulation. And here um, we're interested in and where the state and the local are, are butting heads. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see the difference between, you know, with firearms, you're not necessarily, the state's not necessarily trying to regulate that would be contrary to the Second Amendment. No one's arguing that. Whereas you do, I mean, it's been completely legalized in California. It's still federally, you know, there are potential criminal liability for, you know, being caught with marijuana in, in, in California, even though the state has legalized it. There is. A distinction that way, and I'd also make a distinction in terms of, you know, relying on both the argument that, you know, Seattle and uh, Pittsburgh have actually made that of public safety and public health, whereas, you know, people can argue about the, the merits of marijuana, for example, but 38,000 people aren't dying, e dying each year of, you know, the use of marijuana, so. Um, I'm wondering whether if you uphold one city's ability to put a magazine capacity restriction on guns, does that necessarily allow the city next door to become a gun sanctuary? Uh, well, I think that's, that's really one of the most interesting questions here is at what level do we choose to regulate and I think, and I think, if you decided to regulate this on a more local basis, you could, in fact, have cities where where one city heavily restricts guns, and and a city a few miles down the road says no uh, open carry or whatever we want to do. So I think that's the possibility. And in fact, we were talking earlier about this is how these statewide preemption ordinance got started because a, a city in Illinois said, we're going to outlaw all handguns. And then there was this reaction to that. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a choice that we can make. Do we want to have uh, more state control and uniformity? And there's great advantages to that, even for, uh, for gun advocates, gun owners, to be able to know that as they travel through particular places, they're going to know what the regulations are. But there's also a lot of room, I think, for recognizing um, different characters of different areas and saying that in one place uh, we might choose to operate our, our gun laws differently uh, than another place and both laws be anchored towards safety. Yeah, I would also point out some of the research we were talking about from a uh, professor from Duke, Joseph Blotcher, who's actually argued that you should have this idea, this idea of firearms localism, so allowing for more urban areas to actually be able to have stricter gun controls and more rural areas to, um, you know, have less re restrictive. And part of the argument that he actually has is that when you're out in rural areas, we can go hunting and do stuff. You're doing what's, you know, you, you're more likely to do what is, you know, permissible under the Second Amendment, for example. Um, but I would also say when, when we're looking at these issues between whether this city can have firearm, stricter firearms regulations in the next city might become a sanctuary is that even when they're regulating, they're not, they still have to comply with the Second Amendment. Right. They can't, they can't overstep, you know, constitutional protections. And we, we do see, still see cities facing that. For example, Chicago with Giselle, uh, the city and county of San Francisco in Jackson, um, they, their safe storage ordinance was challenged as well. Um, so, we, we do want to look at that and look at how you can respond differently, but we also need to remember that even within this framework, we're looking at this 
state local dynamic, we still have a second amendment that we still have to adhere to. Hello, I had a question for Mrs. Simon. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned multiple times that the minority often want to uh, just let out their point of view. But I was wondering how much of it also includes the tradition, the needs uh, between the big cities and the rural areas. Like, in your experience, what, how can we uh, help this tension by a regulatory point of view? And also, I was wondering how much of the economics could be affected in these occasions. Like, if rural areas have um, hunting season, if rural areas have gun shops rather than big cities that it's not really much needed there. So I was wondering about the economic side of it. Yeah, so the question about, about culture is, is really an important one because I, uh, in fact the Blocker article refers to that, that we have different cultures about guns and in some places uh, growing up hunting is, is a tradition that's passed on from grandparents to grandchildren and, and, uh, and we have very differing points of view. Um, one of the things, that, one of the reasons I just realized now, thank you for that, for passing out the maps, is that the map on, on where we have uh, these gun sanctuary ordinances is very similar to a lot of other maps in the state of Illinois. Um, there's a, a rural advocacy uh, institute at Western Illinois University, and they have maps on things like access to dental care, uh, spending per pupil in the state of Illinois, um, poverty rates, and, and the maps are so similar. We've got rural areas, big rural areas that have less of many things. We have urban areas that have more of many things, more of, of opportunity, and some of it is choices that we make, but I think some of it is that we in rural areas are failing as advocates for ourselves. Uh, so I think there's some there's some cultural divides that we would do well as residents of rural areas, and I say this as a as a rural person, um, or at least that's how I identify. Can we use that language? Um, that we need to be better advocates for ourselves and 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 make sure that people who don't share those cultural values at least understand uh, our cultural values in the same way that we need to make sure that we understand theirs. I got together a group of freshman uh, legislators when I was lieutenant governor and we had to uh, pass a concealed carry law in Illinois. We were the last state to have a concealed carry law. Um, and what I arranged was a, an urban and rural Democratic and Republican uh, study group. We went to the, the state-sponsored gun range in southern Illinois. We heard from gun owners who wanted to be able to travel through various states and know what the restrictions would be. Uh, and we met in a church basement in Chicago with families, surviving family members of victims of gun violence. And, and there was a lot of waking up going on from both sides, from people who came from one perspective and then had the opportunity to see the other and to see the human side of the other. So I think we have some more uh, ability to do that. Your second part of your question, though, on uh, certainly there are places in, in rural America that, uh, where, where firearms are important to the economy. Uh, and where what you do with firearms is important to the economy. So yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah, thank you. I think another wrinkle to this is not just culture, but need. So for example, I lived in Seattle one summer, and with uh, the first week that I moved there, um, Literally down the street, there was a mass shooting in a coffee shop where we were going to go. And there's serious mental health, lack of access issues in Seattle. And so that combination with guns, it, it was just palpable that there needed to be more restrictions in a place like Seattle. Compare that to, say, my aunt who's in her 70s in Oregon, in rural Oregon, where they lost funding for law enforcement. There is no sheriff. She has to have guns to protect herself. No one will come. I mean, she can't even call 911 where she's at. And so it seems to me there's just a tremendous difference in need surrounding firearms in this country that, that perhaps a, a blunt instrument of preemption 
would disregard in a really dangerous way. And I don't know if you have looked into some of the rationales behind sanctuary or preemption. And I'm sure it's not just cultural, but it's addressing true public health issues. Absolutely. I'll say that. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I agree as well. I think, honestly, I hadn't heard about that, that specific issue where you'd lose. But it, it, you know, it, it makes sense that it is. But that's the thing about preemption as well, is that it is this one size fits all that everything becomes you know, a statewide issue. Whereas, I mean, Seattle is a great, great thing. But I mean, when it comes to firearms generally, we also have to remember that, that, that there is not just in America, this idea of different need from different places, the idea of attaching culture, like even in the European Union, they recently had a case deciding where it was against uh, the Czech Republic where they were arguing that the European Union couldn't regulate firearms because this was part of their deep history and firearms are, are you know, a big thing in the Czech Republic. Um, you know, there's a famous firearms brand that's sold here. Um, and Poland actually made a similar argument intervening. So it's not just, I mean, we think about it as a uniquely American thing, but there are some ties of culture and ties and different needs. For example, when you live in a rural area, regardless of whether you're in the United States, if you're you know in rural Wyoming or in New York City, or if you're in Prague or somewhere out in the, in the sticks, these issues do tend to. I mean, it, it almost seems like it's kind of this natural human thing, especially in you know our modern states, is that we have this cultural tie to it and we have very differing needs. But specifically with the U.S. too, I think part of the issue too is that something that some Scholars have argued about this idea of, you know, that the way we look at um, authority of cities is not keeping up with how we shifted from an agrarian society to a more urban one as well. And I mean, you can say that for the urban cities, but perhaps we're also not thinking about these more rural areas as well. And part of that might be to this kind of adversarial nature we have to certain hot, bu hot button issues where, you know, we, for example, we assume that Republicans are the only ones that are promoting this pro gun agenda where if you look at um, some some states where there are Democrats that have actually come out and support supported stronger preemption as well. So I think one of the things that gets back to is Professor Diller's point about redistricting uh, because I don't think we'll have effective representation unless we have redistricting that is less partisan. Uh, the, the redistricting that we have now uh, drives the races to the primaries, and then the primaries drive the people to the extremes, and uh, and that leads to folks getting together in Springfield, in Washington, thinking I, I'm on the other team rather than I'm part of a democratic process. So I'm maybe the next time we get together, I'll get to hear a great paper about how we've made great progress on redistricting. I'm hopeful. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for uh, for coming, talking about this. Um, something, Matthew, that you said during your talk about uh, there, there being sort of a vacuum, uh, a lack of guidance from Congress or you know just just any kind of federal legislation, and so you're you're having this this fight between states and local government. So I'm sort of thinking, um, could you pass a a federal law that preempts state law's ability <laughs> to preempt <The> <laughs> uh, local governments and, and just sort of have a, a federal law that says, you guys figure it out, whatever it is, we're not gonna stop it. I mean, is that a solution? I mean, good luck trying to get that passed, but um, you know, just, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, anything in this climate that would erode the Second Amendment in any way? Um, no, probably. I, I do know that when it came to um, trying to encourage less preemption when it comes to firearms, specifically with safe storage, for example, uh, last year, I can't remember what all of the um, members of the House, but I guess they generally referred them together as the squad. They actually put forward a, a, a bill that obviously didn't go anywhere that would actually allow, that would actually call for um, more authority for cities to do this stuff. But when it comes to actually I mean, and of course it went nowhere. And the reason why I raised that, like both sides of the argument, I, I just don't see it going anywhere because, you know, it's not, and I wouldn't just say it's the National Rifle Association. I think that there's kind of this 
sense of identity that certain people have when that are pro gun rights that they just they see the Second Amendment as something important. And sure, it, it certainly could be. Um, but in terms of you know working against a big lobby in Washington to get something done, I mean, it seems like a fool's errand, honestly. Yeah, I think it's theoretically possible. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you just mentioned safe storage laws. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure why that's even a, an issue in today's society. In 2008, I, it's my understanding that the Supreme Court held unconstitutional the trigger lock provision that D.C. had in effect under any standard of review. What do you think, why do you think that's still an issue being litigated today? Was it true in that? That it was basically I'm, banned in D.C.? Yeah. I I, I'm... Okay, I, I don't know enough about the trigger lock issue to comment. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember Heller actually being absolute on that. I do know that Jackson was dealt with by the Ninth Circuit, and they act, obviously was de it was done on procedural grounds. They said that effectively Jackson didn't have enough of a strong case to challenge uh, safe storage on Second Amendment grounds to even go to trial. Um, I would assume that a, an inferior court would not directly overrule the Supreme Court. I know it's been challenged uh, both in two other um, courts as well, courts of appeal as well, and I haven't, I, honestly, the, the probably the honest answer is just it's probably an unsettled legal issue. So, I, I, like, that's, honestly, that's probably where it is right now, where is it's, it's probably just unsettled, but. Professor Davis, uh, you mentioned that you thought Seattle would have a better chance than Pittsburgh mm -hmm. in its litigation because of Washington's mere attempt to create uniformity in the law rather than intent to preempt. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the distinction between the two. Okay, so it wasn't just uniformity, it was uniformity in criminal law. So that was their intent, was purely criminal law. and. I think that that has a stronger argument compared to um, Pennsylvania, purely for the chance it, it's it's much clearer in jurisprudence as well that that we've absolutely preempted the field. Even the strong police argument, the court actually did say that the argument was frivolous. The the Supreme Court in, in Pennsylvania. So I'm just reacting on on what the jurisprudence tells me at this point. Um, so I think the fact that there is that scope and the fact that uh, and other issues we see, you know, from Hugh Spitzer and looking at some of these um, nonprofits that, you know, support municipal corporations in Washington that have actually argued that more authority is dictated by the Home Rule Charter for s at least certain cities in, in Washington. So that's where I see the di difference, whereas in Pennsylvania, it doesn't seem, especially when it comes to firearms, that Home Rule matters at all. Any other questions? Yeah, this is for uh, Professor Davis. This is a couple questions here I got for you. First of all, you cited 38,000 uh, firearm deaths. Does that include uh, both suicide and self-defense usage of a firearm, in the, or is this just homicides? Uh, so a few years dated, so CDC doesn't really necessarily get all the funding to do these reports anymore, um, you know, lobbying efforts. But I, I do believe it, it, it accumulates all of them. But like I said, it is underreported because, you know, sometimes they just don't get reported. So it, the reason why I said it's actually a little over 38,000, it's just a rough ballpark of what the research suggests from the Center for Disease Control. But that's total deaths from firearms. They don't distinguish it, right? Right. Okay. The second question is, what liability, if any, does a municipality have if they pass either a red flag law or restrictive rights uh, on the Second Amendment and as a result there's a death, for instance, if somebody can't get to their firearm because they have a storage law that says it has to be locked in a safe and a burglar breaks in and kills that person, what liability does the municipality have in regards to that? Honestly, uh yeah, you know, I wouldn't answer the question directly. My background is not in municipal law, and I would assume they would depend on the state. Um, yeah, that's just not my area of law. Will, do you have any expertise oh. to offer? 
I, yeah, I don't. I don't actually have an expertise in that. I think. I think the political implications that would be very, very strong, right? If that were to happen, then I think there would be. Uh, um, it would. There would be a lot of uh, uh, lobbying to try to, you know, to change those regulations, maybe. Uh, I do have some experience with the Municipal Attorneys Association in West Virginia, and uh, I will tell you, we would be sued. Uh, the NRA is not shy about lawsuits. They have a lot of money. Uh, they are, they do not discriminate upon small cities or large cities, and they spread the wealth, if you will. <laughs> but um, any, it's almost like a damned if you do and damned if you don't. So you know, most likely, uh, we would, we would be drawn into that as a municipality. So you would be sued, but couldn't you claim a sovereign immunity, or would the sovereign immunity be waived in that kind of situation? That we would be pounded with discovery, such as where was your, where are your empirical research in regard to undertaking this ordinance, um, the comments at the public hearing, uh, the backgrounds of the governing body as to um, their uh, different orientation in regard to gun control, etc. It would probably, basically, it would tax very, very much uh, the municipality. Of course, we have insurance defense, but then again, some of the provisions in the insurance defense may, may knock out all of the, um, the potential uh, defenses. But a lot of people now will, will form a deliberate intent claim and that will override our insurance provisions and then potentially bankrupt a smaller municipality. So would that influence advice that you would give to a municipality about considering some kind of regulation? Oh, surely anything like that. Um, number one, there are municipal experts that that even to assist your local council uh, to employ and then to do have have a ton of research to back up why that ordinance is being enacted so that you have a better factual basis other than, gee, this was a good idea that Tuesday evening. Understood. Thank you. That was a, that was a very provocative question. It was very thoughtful. Um, anyone else got any questions? I wanted to chime in with one last question for Professor Davis. Uh, I wanted to go into a bit into uh, your experience in the UK uh, with their examples. Uh, I would, um, we all know that Scotland's a little more uh, rural, there's Wales, there's Northern Ireland, there's England. Um, it, it's not just one big city in England. So I was curious if you could go into a little bit about their experiences in enacting their regulations uh, whether they attempted to balance any of these interests or they just adopted uh, uniform laws for everywhere or, um, you know, r really just to ex explain a little more about their experience in enacting their choices and in, in how they came to those decisions. Okay, yeah. So the one thing I'd point out before we, we kind of do some distinction, it is a unitary system, literally, and Parliament has parliamentary sovereignty, so whatever Parliament says, legally you have to do. So... There's a lot of difference, and especially when it turn, comes to political influences that people can have. Um, but as far as I'm aware, what actually prompted a stricter gun control, it was always slightly more strict than we have here, was actually a shooting at a school in Scotland. Um, and and, and they, they, that was the response. Pretty similar to what you saw in Australia as well, where there was a mass shooting, and then all of a sudden they had a buyback program. Um, so, I mean, it is different, but, you know, there are some like cultural differences as well, but there are things. There are certain examples too that you can look at other other countries that actually have a little bit more requirements when it comes to firearms. That you know, if you look at it, it may not actually restrict, especially people that would normally any person would would suggest would have a lawful right to exercise the, the right to bear arms. If you look for a recent Czech Republic, for example, you have to go through a health check. You have to go through a mental health check. Um, in, in Germany, especially for younger firearms users, you need to be tied to a gun club. 
And there's also the potential, depending on your age, depending on your issue, they can actually ask for a mental health check for you to have control of firearms. Um, but going back to England, it is somewhat restrictive, but I, I think sometimes when you see the media coverage of it, you can actually get licenses to carry. Um, but the firearms dynamic is different, though. We actually, in, in the UK, not all police officers carry firearms. We have special firearms expert officers that, that have to go through special training for it. So it's an entirely different culture when it comes to guns as well. So, I mean, it's interesting to, to compare, but there's a lot of differences that kind of make it really hard to kind of draw too many examples from it to use in the US, I would say. Any other questions? Okay, well, I have a few, so, or maybe two, okay, <laughs> since, since we're all, um, so, uh, Matthew, this, this might be beyond the scope of your research, but I'm curious to know if sort of more gun safety leaning organizations like Every Town for Gun Safety have ever you tried to sort of use similar tactics like, you know, ALEC and the NRA on a local level. Actually, yeah, you just reminded me of something I should have included, and in. all five of the cases I covered are actually being supported by Every Town for Gun Violence. So, yeah, the answer is definitely yes, they do do that. So, so, but do they do it mostly in a reactive way? Um, a I mean, to the extent my research is looking at it, it's my research is just the way it's set up is generally more reactive, so that's what I'm looking at. But So I couldn't comment to whether they provide, you know, preemptive advice, but, you know, definitely from what I've seen, reactive. And uh, Sh Sheila, this is just the basic question about sanctuaries that, that maybe you, you've already addressed, but like um, if a local, say like a county sheriff just said, hey, uh, you passed this, this uh, state ordinance on guns, it's legitimate, we're not saying it's, we don't, we don't think it's constitutional, but you have the power, you're, you're, you're our superior, we're just not gonna enforce it. You can come and send your, you can send state troopers to come and enforce it, but in our county, we're not gonna enforce it. Um, and then sort of related to that, is there sort of a disciplinary issue when you have sheriffs, you know, saying that they're gonna deputize people and not, you know, like, like how is that handled as a personnel issue maybe even just? Yeah, so who's the boss of the sheriff? The electorate at, in the counties where the sheriff is elected, which is certainly what we deal with. Um, so I think the sheriff is gonna have less discretion because the sheriff is gonna have the sheriff's association who's going to say, here are the kinds of liability that you would have if you choose not to enforce these laws. The more interesting question where there, where there is some discretion is with a prosecutor who does have a great deal of discretion and could say, okay, so the sheriff's made the arrest, but I'm not charging the crime. Uh, and that could certainly happen and, and is well within the, the range of the local prosecutor to make that decision. Thank you. Um, do y'all have any, we have a little bit of time, any, any last remarks or comments you want to make? Thanks for your attention and your questions. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Let's give them a hand. Thank you again so much to our panelists and to Professor Rui for moderating. Um, we are going to take a short 10 minute break. Um, there are snacks in the hallway, so I hope you're hungry again. Um, and we will reconvene at 245. Thank you. Thank you.